Welcome to SCR Connection. Thank you everyone for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Mona Ramonetti. Mona is the head of scholarly communications at Stony Brook University Libraries. She heads up many committees and working groups related to open educational resources, open access policy and publishing, copyright, data management, among others. She is the OER campus lead for Stony Brook University. She currently serves on various Stony Brook University boards, in addition to being a member of the Coalition of Open Access Policy Institutions Steering Committee. In today's SCR Connection, Mona will give an interactive presentation on scholarly communication in academic libraries, an ever-changing landscape of responsibilities. Thank you, Mona, for being our guest speaker this morning, and I will turn everything over to you. Terrific. Thank you, Edward. And thank you all for attending. Thank you for the invitation. Um, typically, when I give a presentation, it's not behind a screen. It's behind a podium that I usually step out from behind. And I tend to, my presentation, presentations tend to be interactive. It, I treat it more as a conversation and um, less as a lecture. And it, the reasons for that, I find that it becomes uh, fruitful or, or, or a lot of, we all learn from it. So uh, I would like to think that maybe we can have some semblance of that. So go ahead and, and send those those questions into the chat and I will respond as I go through my presentation. So we'll get started. Um, scholarly communication. Uh, I am not going to assume that everybody is in the know with regard to what scholarly, what scholarly communication is in academic libraries. Uh, so it, it is a, it's a field within librarianship, of course, and it essentially centers around I'm sorry, one second. Um, oh. Mona, remember you're yeah. sharing your screen. Yes, remember, and it, it, it's- You supposed to share, remember how we practiced the other day where you share your content? Or is that the top where share content? Oh, I see. And you share it your screen and you present it from your Google Docs? Okay, one moment then. Oh, I, I, okay, one second. Let's go back to that. So it's share and, okay. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, we're on track. So it's calling communications essentially uh, it was, it, it, it found its uh, origins in assisting our, our, our faculty, our researchers in getting their scholarly pursuits out there, disseminated, available. Um, and essentially, it, initially it was these uh, materials that showcased what they did. But it, it needed to be created curated and managed and policies and procedures need to be needed to be put in place in order to, to make it run properly. So that is really the, the push behind scholarly communication. And within the school, in order for scholarly communication to actually exist, we need to have a platform that hosts, that, that houses all of this information. So, uh, institutions have uh, this platform, it's called, usually called an institutional repository. And, um, and you know, I'm not, you can take a second to read that. But it's materials that are generated from the institution's academic community. So for Stony Brook, our institutional repository is called Academic Commons. It is a product that we, we purchased from B Press. And for, we use our institutional repository to hold uh, uh, materials that are open access in nature, open educational resources, data management, 
in addition to the, our institutional repository, we have research guides, as I'm, I'm sure many of you who are librarians uh, on this call are familiar with that. So my presentation today, I'm actually going to be talking about these four different aspects of the scholarly communications umbrella that I deal with. Some of these are mostly 80, 85 percent of my responsibilities really have to do with open access, open educational resources, data management, and copyright. So what I'll be doing is um, shifting back and forth, and I, I, I'll be showing you what our institutional repository looks like uh, as they relate to uh, open access, OER, and, and data management. And then I will also switch to our, our website where the research guide is housed. Okay, so uh, when Edward approached me, he had mentioned that a number of individuals were interested in open access and the open access movement. And uh, yes, it's a huge part of my job and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to be part of, of this movement. What is the movement? The movement essentially is it's social, it, it's socially just, it's social justice in nature in the sense that for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the, the publishing process, uh, most of the funding that goes into research a, a lot, it comes from public dollars, our taxpayer dollars. So uh, the, we have these um, funding community, funding organizations that provide these funds to researchers throughout the world, and more specifically, right now we're talking about within the United States. And so the the recipients get the money, they do the research, they get their findings, and then it's time for them to disseminate this, to make it available to, to those who want to have access to this. The process, historically, the process has been where these findings now are have to be published. And so they go through a publisher, which is a privately owned company, and they essentially pay the publisher to to host, to publish their the findings. And then the publishers then in turn charge libraries and institutions and corporations to get access to these these findings, these articles. Oftentimes, the libraries that are paying for this are libraries that are publicly funded. So we are actually paying from the on on both ends. So <laughs> a lot of. of um, Institutions worldwide and the open access movement has its origins in Europe. And a lot of European institutions, along with American institutions as well, said we have to stop this because the top taxpayer dollars, are, we're spending twice. And these large publishing um, corporations are making a lot of money off of us. So the, the push was to stop that, to mitigate that. Also, uh, in doing, in, in setting up this model where uh, individuals or corporations, institutions have to pay, and that it's it, it's affordable to some extent. It, it's not sustainable. However, that excludes a large part of the worldwide population, notably several countries who do not have the funds to access this information. And a lot of this information, all of the findings, results are medical uh, in nature and uh, medical research in nature and, and STEM um, as well, uh, some humanities, some social sciences. But these, this information needs to be out there and needed to be out there and continues to be uh, needed to be out there. So the movement really took hold because it, it really uh, sh shone, shone the light on the disparity, the inequity that was happening in terms of access to this valuable information that in some in some instances could be a difference between life and death in terms of a, a, a procedure or you know, something innovative in the medical community. So this, this uh, movement is 20 plus years uh, right now, and I, I can't say in the making because it's really taken hold right now. 
Uh, and Stony Brook in February 2017, Stony Brook University is the first university within the SUNY system. The SUNY is a state university of New York. And we essentially adopted, we said, we're going to put forth an open access policy that basically says we're taking this movement seriously. And we, are, we want to provide a platform where this material is openly accessible and freely accessible to everyone in the world. And so that was a commitment that was made on the part of Stony Brook University Libraries. And in doing so, our institutional repository, which is Academic Commons, and I had mentioned that earlier, uh, that became the platform on which individuals would now deposit their work uh, um, and make it freely available to everyone in the world. So I'm actually going to click on that right now, our academic commons. And this is what it looks like. It, it is, it, you can go to Stonebrook University Library's website and click on academic commons if, on the upper right hand side of the page. And this is what you pull up. A very utilitarian looking uh, page, but it serves the purpose. It serves the purpose in the sense that it, it is making this this information available, it is, uh, all of it is uh, um, available, uh, I'm sorry, organized alphabetically. So the first one, this here is actually a data set, uh, a huge data set that we uh, managed to get hold of. And uh, I think in 2020, yes, COVID really has screwed up a lot of our timing, our perspective on time. So uh, it really, it's just a list of what we have in the repository. So this is a, a data set. We have conferences and events. This is our most recent collection and it's empty. I can show you right now it's empty because it's still in the works in terms of uh, some of my colleagues in the library thought that we should be documenting Stony Brook University's uh, response to COVID. And yes, we are affiliated with the hospital as well. So we, we have all sorts of different perspectives that we would like to uh, contribute to, you know, this, this, it's not just a memory project. It's basically showcasing our responses. This particular one collection here will now is available for those individuals who have articles who are publishing materials on COVID related um, matters. So we, we hope to see this populated uh, fairly soon. The next thing I'd like to find, I don't want to go through all of them, but the, the next one I would like to highlight is the Journal of Network Music and Arts. This is our, excuse me, <coughs> our second open access journal that we have on this, on this platform. Excuse me. However, it's the first one that we have published. And we published this in November of 2018, working with uh, faculty members from the music and, and arts department and artists and performers all around the world contributed to this journal, this open access journal. I'll click on it. Again, very utilitarian in, 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 in uh, visually, but it, it gets you to the information. And it, the information on this, the content of this is, it's text-based, but also for this particular journal, um, it's also, we have videos and music integration as well. And I'm not gonna go through that because it's gonna actually eat up a lot of our time. Uh, and when it comes to the articles, the deposit of articles and the different departments who contribute to the institutional repository, here is the list of schools and colleges within Stony Brook uh, University and Stony Brook Hospital and Medical School that have contributed to our institutional repository. And I could just give you, uh, let's see, um, a sense of what it looks like. Let me see, um, Department of Biochemistry and Cell Biology. So I clicked on that. And here is just a link to all of the publications that are here. PDF, PDF form, very simple. And you click on it and you can download it to your desktop or you could just scan it to see what it looks like. Sure. 
and um, and uh, I'm sorry, I just got interrupted a bit here. And and then we can scroll down. We can scroll down. Oh, it seems I've lost control of what I'm doing here. There we go. Okay. So yes, so we have this is this is what it looks like. Should you want to print it out as well, it, if you wanted a hard copy. Now let's go back to the main page here. And I just want to show you what the user, but when a, a faculty member, researcher, or a student, students do contribute to this as well, when they want to deposit their work. And in the lower left-hand side, we have an author FAQ. We have the policies for the, the institutional repository submission guidelines. And this is what they're usually looking for. Deposit your work. And it's, again, straightforward. You fill in the necessary information. It's not arduous. And then you click and upload your file. It is then sent to me. I'm given a notification. I look through it to make sure that it meets our standards and our criteria that we have designated uh, for this particular platform. And then I make it public. It, the turnaround is very, very quick. And I try to do it as quickly as possible because oftentimes when individuals are doing this, <laughs> there, there's a reason why they're, they're, they're trying to put this up right away. They're trying to meet a deadline. So there we are with that. Um, okay. And one second. Edward, I am um, not seeing my screen. Okay. For some odd reason, I'm not seeing my screen again. We can, we can see. No, I got it. I got it. I got it again. I think I'll. I reloaded it. Um, okay. All right. So we'll switch next to uh, to open educational resources. Are there any questions thus far? That uh, I, I mean, I, I hope I'm not racing through this. And I thank you for that person who has the, their cat purring. <laughs> it adds a, a nice bit of levity to, to something that can be quite dry as well. Okay. We'll go ahead, open educational resources. And these are, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with them, the, the acronym of course is OER. And again, social justice in nature, the, its origins. And uh, in terms of how this, how we got into this, and this is actually how I got into this scholarly communications field. It's happened in around 2017 in New York State uh, Governor Cuomo uh, instituted the Excelsior program, and this program is essentially a no cost, no, no tuition, a new, no tuition program for individuals who met certain, of course, financial criteria. And you know, great, everybody was on board with that. But then, and and they were smart in the sense of, yes, this was a program that got people in. But they were also cognizant that the, the individuals that put forth this program, they were cognizant of the fact that many students that go to college cannot afford their course materials. They cannot afford their textbooks. And there are so many studies out there that document students just not purchasing the materials. Uh, other students sort of, you know, getting it through, you know, different ways and others you know, just not doing it and hoping that they pass the class with the notes from the, the instructor that the instructor provides. And then there, there are those who actually go online and sort of uh, uh, ride the line of legality in terms of accessing materials. So uh, this program wanted to mitigate this, just say, look, you know what? We got these students in there. We got to make sure they stay there. We got to make sure that they get uh, the materials that they need. So the push was to have instructors start using openly available materials, low cost or no cost course materials to their students. And when I mean openly available, I mean openly available. This, this material 
um, are open platforms, are academic in nature, scholarly in nature, and they're open to everyone throughout the world. And the main goal here was to help to mitigate the cost of textbooks and course materials by, for students by 50% or more. And, and to incentivize this, they, they said we could provide grants. So uh, Governor Cuomo and his team allotted $8 million to do this for this Open Educational Resources Initiative. And uh, SUNY, State University of New York, we got a half of that and CUNY got the other half. And so, you know, Stony Brook got its share and we immediately started promoting this. And we got some, we got buy-in, of course we got pushback, but we got buy-in. Uh, more importantly, we got buy-in from our, our uh, provost, our, uh, the higher ranking, higher um, ranking individuals on campus were behind this initiative. And that actually helped for us to, to get some momentum and, and to drum up and get the necessary interest uh, that we needed and, and involvement. So it, it's been a, it's a slow but steady pace. To date, we have saved the students over $600,000 since from, from 2017 in the cost of course materials. We have about four, no, more than 40 courses right now that are designated OER courses where the students are not paying for any of these materials. And so it's it's been it's been a success, and we we hope to continue uh, with this with the momentum that we've gained. Um, and I have to say that you know when whenever I present on open educational resources, one of the first questions I usually get is, well, who bought in? Was it you know this well seasoned instructors and researchers, or was it you know the, the individuals you know who were wet behind the ears? And I have to say, it actually runs the gamut where we have just about everybody that you could conceive of um, jumping on board and, and really supporting this by creating their own OER or adopting or adapting already existing OER into their courses. And one of the things I, I, I actually talk about with, with when presenting on OER is the back end aspect of it. More often than not, when you look at the literature on OER, they talk about the front end, the products that have been created. And the, the journey is, is that's the end of the journey, more or less, or maybe the penultimate uh, spot of the journey. What happens before that is, is, is incredibly important. We are talking about um, payments. We're talking about payments of, of funds and uh, working with various entities on campus that can facilitate all of these things happening. And when I first started this work, uh, many individuals in, you know, in procurement, in uh, human resources, the provost office, uh, various uh, academic um, administrative um, um, individuals, were unfamiliar with this. And so it was an, uh, a learning experience for both of us because I too had to learn what they were doing in order to facilitate this process happening. So in doing so, I, I got to learn a lot from my colleagues all around campus. They got to learn from me. They got to support this. Um, and yes, we were very much, I just saw that question, we were very much involved in the outreach and the rolling out of OER. This was something that uh, I, many, many faculty members, many instruct, instructors, I should say, embraced. And while we, we were, uh, we led the charge, we had a lot of supporters, uh, and these supporters were individuals, instructors who had experience with OER and their students uh, gave positive feedback and negative feedback as well. Don't get me wrong, this is, it, it isn't a, it isn't all uh, roses, but we were able to learn a lot from that feedback as well. So it's still a work in progress. We, we, the outreach still continues because, uh, uh, you know, I think sometimes people forget what it is that we're doing as well. And we also have to remind ourselves what we're doing here. In addition to that aspect of it, and, and this is where COVID now comes in, 
where uh, accessibility issues um, arose. And when I mean accessibility, of course, accessing the materials uh, uh, virtually, but also uh, the consideration now became paramount for individuals who had special needs, you know, um, sight, verbal, cognitive. And so we now have to go back and try to see how we could um, accommodate these uh, individuals, uh, these students who needed access, this type of access to the materials. And it's still a very ongoing uh, process, uh, but you know, we, were, we were happy to, to be able to further expand what we were given, what we were, what we were providing. And another a thing that came out of COVID as well it, it has been copyright issues. Um, typically, in a given year, maybe we'd get four or five inquiries regarding copyright. But with COVID, we had a number of instructors who were not only interested in using OER because of the virtual nature of their instruction now, but also uh, what were the rights in terms of how they use this material? And so a lot, we saw an uptick in, in what was happening with the copyright. So I'm just gonna click on our academic commons and, um, and this is what our, it looks like on our academic commons, our open educational resources. Now I want to say that, and I apologize for this. This is, is this particular uh, page is a work in progress right now. We are we need to update it. We're in the process of updating it. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what it looks like on our institutional repository. And more specifically, I wanted to show you what our platform, some of the information it it provides us with. And we have this map. This is up to date to the second. And it shows us the number of downloads. We have 35,000 35, plus downloads as of today of work for that from our, our institution and our institutional repository. And in the last year, 15,000 plus downloads have been made. So, you know, this here also, it not only encompasses our OER and our data manage, our, our data sets. It also encompasses the, our open access articles, and we, you know, we, we have a lot of, of data. And for those who are interested in, in, in some of the data, we have uh, as of today, 177 countries have used some of the, the materials that are on this institutional repository. 275 of our faculty members have contributed to this repository. And this, again, this started in 2017. Um, we have uh, 1996, 1,996 articles that have been posted to this repository. And of those, a lot of them were deposited this past year, uh, 1920 uh, fiscal year, 1,500 of them, more than 1,500 were deposited. So again, it's slow but steady, but we actually we're seeing more of an uptick and I, I, I can only guess that I think COVID is, is really creating conditions under which this is becoming more valuable in the eyes of many um, researchers and, 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 and instructors. Again, a lot of this material, yes, it's, it's, it's scholarly in nature, but we have individuals that are within the field, the medical field, in the industry, uh, STEM industry fields that are using these materials in addition to scholars and, and students. And again, I'll show you this is the same uh, deposit link is here, deposit your work link. It looks the same as the open access link. Okay. And the next thing I'd like to show you is our OER, Open Educational Resources Research Guide. And these things that I, I know, I know um, Edward is going to share all of these with you. Take your time, you know, when, when the mood hits you to explore what we have here. And this is our open educational resources guide. And essentially, it is giving you, uh, the, the user, a sense of what is available 
um, various repositories, various platforms, various courseware, uh, OER Commons, OpenStax, Merlot, which happens to be heavily used uh, at Stony Brook as well, among others. So, um, you know, take, take some time and, and explore it at your leisure, of course. Okay. And we'll go on to, to data management. Now this one here, and again, I have to remember, remind you, these are all on our institutional repository. And we, uh, it's only in the last year and a half or two have we seen um, some more interest in, in data management. And what I mean by that is the public, making data sets available. And these are data sets from, uh, you know, from uh, various laboratories uh, throughout Stony Brook. Our most, I think our most active um, department is the School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. And they've been depositing quite a bit. We, it's, it's actually good to see. And, uh, you know, again, we're, we're, all of these things we're responding to different changes, different variations in the, in our environment and the different needs of our constituents. So we've had to pivot with open access. We've had to pivot with open educational resources and data management, all of these, because these are what our constituents want from us. So it's never a dull day. Um, and here we are. This is what our data sets look like, again, on Academic Commons. Um, and yeah, as I said, we have, it's, it's only recently that uh, the interest has been there to, to deposit their data sets onto, the, onto our repository. Uh, the, the data sets are a little bit tricky in terms of, of the workflow. When, depending on the size of, of the data sets, it can be easy and you can just go through the, the deposit your work link and upload it. And sometimes the data sets are massive. And so we have to work with our B press representative and to help to finagle and accommodate the larger data sets. What that means is that we have to come up with a server, an external server that can host it because we do not have an institutional server on, onto which um, our researchers can put it just yet. So everything is in the works, but we're trying to accommodate our, our constituents. Okay, so let's see. And then lastly, we have the copyright issues. Now, as I had referenced earlier, the copyright issues really, um, you know, actually we saw that uptick when COVID hit. And this is when a lot of instructors were very concerned about, well, you know, I want to get this information up there, but I just want to make sure that I'm doing this legally. And, and we, of course, had to go in and make sure that we were providing the necessary information. But with copyright, we also have to be cognizant that we and make sure that our constituents know that we are not attorneys. And this is what is out in the field. This is the information that's out in the field. And worse comes to worse, if you really would like to use a particular um, uh, resource, you, you, you can go ahead and, and, and contact the author, the creator of these materials. So uh, it, is, it has been a, quite a learning process. And there are five of us that are dedicated to the, to the copyright sort of restructuring of what we're providing right now at Stony Brook University. And again, this is tied into open, our open educational resources where instructors are now thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be doing this virtually. I have to come up with something that's more viable than the hard copies and the hard text. So um, this is where we are. I'll just give you a quick checking on the time. Um, this is what our copyright research guide looks like. This is going to be here for another month or so, and then we're completely revamping this. We have actually listened a lot. We've gotten a lot of feedback from our community, and it, it has actually been helpful in terms of what we, what we want to provide to them in terms of the necessary information. Additionally, um, actually my colleague here, Victoria Plato, and I, along with three other faculty library faculty members taught a copyright course uh, a few months ago, 
and the, the, the feedback we got from our students, and this is, this is to faculty, teaching faculty, uh, it really was very helpful in terms of how we need the changes that we need to make to this guide. Be that as it may, uh, some of the things that I'd just like to show you, and, and they're still just as valuable right now, even though they will be tweaked. This was the, this this uh, tab here was of course the most used for us in the past few months, and it's copyright and and as it relates to online teaching, you know, fair use, the Teach Act. So again, I encourage you to take a look at this at, and 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 see what you can glean uh, and what's useful for you um, with regard to copyright. And I, I will go back now to our OER guide. And the only reason I'm doing that is because within OER, our Open Educational Resources, those that are adopting it or, or want to use it, they are, are use in, uh, openly available resources that are, are, are currently available. They make the mistake of thinking that open means open. And there's some, there's some materials, some course materials, that are indeed open, but there are different levels of open. So there's a Creative Commons license that all of these materials use and, and adopt. And um, some of them, like the CC BY one, is where you you can share as, as long as you you give credit, and you can you can uh, modify and adopt and adapt whatever it is that you deem appropriate for your own use. Of course, it has to be educational in nature. But there are other types of licenses that um, users need to be aware of. So this guide actually shows that there's some limitations, there's some stipulations to using these materials, and it's not a free-for-all. So we, we encourage our users to be cognizant of this and not fall into the trap that it is, you know, it's, it's, it's for everybody. Or you can do whatever it is that you want with that. Okay. So the challenges with this, of course, there are there are always challenges. Um, Buy-in, buy-in from our campus members. These are a lot of these movements, a lot of these changes that we're doing the initiatives um, are are new, are, are are new and sometimes foreign to a particular fabric on the campus. And it is our responsibility because this is happening. Either we, you know, take note of it and, and run with it if it resonates with us, or we can leave it behind. But this is actually happening throughout the world. The open access movement is happening and is gaining momentum and, and legitimacy. So uh, we have to, and this is where the outreach comes in, where we are, we speak to various entities on campus um, many times throughout the year to make sure that we are remembered and, and we folks remember what it is that we're doing. And that gets to our second point, staying relevant. We have to make sure that we convey to our constituents that this work is, is, uh, is happening and it's going to continue to happen and we should be part of this. This is, this is a social justice issue in terms of making this available to everybody regardless of financial stature, regardless of where you are in the world. And I guess this should have been at the top of the list of your bureaucracy. I think we all face this on some level. Uh, just learning how to, to work with various entities on campus and off campus to get what you need to get this, this process going. Um, I can say that interpersonal skills have been probably the best tool that I've had in, in all of these different uh, endeavors in, under the scholarly communication umbrella. It is you, you learn to collaborate, you, uh, and you learn to, you know, when you should step back, you learn when you should advocate. And, um, and at the end of the day, we're a community and we wanna make sure that folks remember that. So, but the bureaucracy still is there. There's still, we still are, you know, are, <laughs> we, you know, it, we, SUNY controls a lot of the purse strings. So we, we still have to deal with folks up in, in, in the upstate to make sure that we get the money in a timely manner to support these things. And even, even just outside of money, just 
getting this out and and um, visible, uh, we have to go through many layers as well. So we're we're making a lot of progress, thankfully. So uh, takeaways. Basically, uh, this stuff is and 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 it, it's not a leap to say that it's it's a social justice movement. It is, and the idea is to make all of this as much as possible free of charge. Uh, when we talk about open access, yes, definitely. When we talk about open educational resources, yes, we have to somehow level the playing field for individuals where uh, finances are a hurdle. Finances are a, a challenge, um, but that shouldn't preclude them from getting access to this information that is necessary for for their education. And I touched upon this, the second one. Interpersonal skills and collaborative relationships really are very, very important in this work. It is, uh, again, I can't stress it enough. And lastly, I mean, I actually sort of uh, thought about if I should even mention this, but I think whenever I, uh, I start a relationship with a, an instructor, we always end up with a copyright, the like copyright conversation. Because I think it, it's not really part of our, our mental fabric in terms of, of academia, but it really is a very important one. And so more often than not, I am there trying to remind folks that this is, is, is very important uh, in the process as well. And that is it, folks. Any questions? Thank you for your attention. Yes, we have some questions in the chat. Um, one stated, um, apologies, OER is new to me. Exactly who got paid on the back end and for what? Who gets paid on the back end? Okay, so the initiative that we instituted that the Governor Cuomo um, put forth, the instructors, those who are, who are creating the OER, those who are adopting and or adapting these OER in their courses, they're the ones that are getting, in, well, actually, let me, let me make a clarification here. When this was, was uh, rolled out, the initial, the initial chunk of money that was designated to incentivize this, it was given to individuals who were already using OER and didn't even realize that they were using OER. So they were compensated for that. When that was finished, actually, concurrently, we set up a grant program as well where individuals who wanted to adopt, adapt, or create their own OER were given a lump sum to create it. And, and the stipulation was that they would use it for at least three years thereafter. And that they would save their students 50% or more in, in terms of the cost. So the instructors are the ones that are receiving the money um, to create these OER. We had another question. Um, is there a way to search across institutional repositories or would you just use a Google Scholar? I was wondering how a user could locate data sets um, to their research without having to go into hundreds of IRs. I see. Uh, it, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I think we can, in terms of, of looking for OER, we can we have some resources, the OER Commons, OpenStack, and those are basically for uh, course materials. The, the data sets are a little trickier in terms of, of a repository that, that searches across many disciplines. Nothing comes to mind, but I I can certainly, um, and that's a really good question. I can certainly explore that. But to in in my knowledge, nothing is coming to mind that there is, is there's something that provides that service in terms of of, of data sets. And we had another one. Um, do you focus on storing research data, or do you also assist with data management plans? And, uh, and other data related issues. Oh, very good question. We are in the we 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 do focus on the sets absolutely, but we're actually part of a bigger uh, group of individuals on campus where uh, and the hospital as well on the medical side. Um, and in the last 
two, three months, we have put together a plan where we are making or we want to create a resource where individuals can, yes, discuss policy, discuss uh, um, how to approach this, this, discuss where they can go, where, where they can put their data sets. And right now, our institutional repository is where it's being housed. But the, the bigger picture actually is uh, we have entities from different, it's East and West Campus. And East Campus is the medical side, the hospital side, and then in this West Campus, which is the academic side. So we, we are coming together and we all have various research needs. So we're looking for a platform that can meet these needs. And one of the biggest things is actually the data set. So there's more to come with that, but as of now, it is our institutional repository is where we're we're hosting them. But uh, and maybe for the next year or so. But we'll see. It just depends on on if we can all come to an agreement in terms of a particular platform that meets all of our needs. I think we have time for one more question and. This one that just popped up. Do you know if there is resource for academic institutions taking part in OER? There are resources for uh, institutions. Well, we have um, we have our, our SUNY OER, which is the State University of, of New York. We have it's called SUNY OER Services. And while it you know it's mostly comprised of SUNY OER uh, campus leads and uh, folks, it is open to, to others as well. Uh, what I suggest individuals who are interested in this is to reach out to other colleagues within their, their system, their school system, or reach out to me. And, and a lot of the, the collaboration really is you, you reach out to somebody who, who you think would be of, of help to you or you have a shared interest. And and then uh, there's there are a lot of relationships that can um, pop up from those. But in terms of OER, I I, I hate to say it, but we we I've just been sort of working with our SUNY OER folks uh, because I mean we are 60 plus institutions and fairly comprehensive, and it's, it's you know it runs the gamut from you know R1 like Stony Brook to Many colleges, so we're getting the whole the whole um, picture in terms of uh, the different types of students that are out there and their needs. Thank you, Mona, for that wonderful presentation. It was a pleasure um, having you with us this morning. I'm going to um, take the ball from you, and that way we can get into the demographics. I'm going to stop the recording.